Hey everybody, I'm Sean Robinson, and that camera over there is Carson Grubaugh. Hello, we hello. Living, living the line, and today we're going to take a look at uh, modern illustration or modern illustrating, including cartooning, Division Two. It's so hard not Our to call it illustration, huh? I keep making that <laughs> mistake every time I type it out. It so uh, this was put together by Art Instruction Incorporated, which was a uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, as you can see, uh, <laughs> company that uh, specialized in something that's basically disappeared now, which was in the mail art instruction. I actually figured, filled out um, one of these things when I was a, a kid. I don't know if they still had them when you were a kid a year later, Carson, but they were kind of on the wane. <laughs> when you were a kid a year later. <laughs> yeah. It was like, can you copy this turtle? <laughs> no, I did the Joe Kubert mail-in thing oh, okay. uh that was the only mailing thing i did Kubert had that you know before i actually went there so you'd send them your pages and either uh joe Kubert supposedly was drawn on them but when i actually went there i found out uh, sergio carrillo was doing a lot of the lifting on that they they would write all over your uh they draw all over your drawing on on uh, transparent paper and vellum paper and nice. send them back to you um i'm assuming this was something similar Right, exactly, exactly the the exact same model. Uh, you would uh, send away for the course work. You would get this stuff doled out to you, and then you would be able to submit uh, your results to different prompts that they would send, and then they would give you instruction on vellum or tracing paper or whatever taped to your artwork. And a pretty famously, Charles Schultz was one of the people who would draw on your papers and send them back to you before he started working on peanuts. He worked for this company. One of our viewers ex explained that to me when I first posted these. Um, so uh, <laughs> I want to make a, uh, a preface here that I do want to go through the whole book. Um, and we are, I don't know, are we still thinking about potentially reprinting yeah. this? Yes. Um, this is a document from its time, and I'm going to put it online in total. When yeah. we print this, there will be a piece that some, we take out, I think. Yeah, some boulderization. Uh. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm like scared to even show it on camera. So please <laughs> don't take this as a uh, advocation that what is... <laughs> <laughs> done in here like how do how do we even preface this uh this is a historical document we're showing yes. <laughs> which has some um wildly racist cartooning in it let's just put it that way uh but i also i don't believe in editing that kind of thing out of the historical record uh because it's, it's i be i believe it's better to keep it on the historical record as a lesson for mistakes that we've made right and if you totally edit those kind of things, I think it's much more likely we're going to make the same mistakes. But I also know that in today's environment, it's dangerous just to even show some of this stuff. So this particular volume has uh, a piece in it, yeah, uh, an instruction lesson that is highly disturbing. So I'll show it shows up. There's a chapter about it and it shows up on the poster as well. Um, where they take a word, which I'm not uh -huh. going to say, and they make then a very <laughs> overly yeah. stereotyped uh, character drawing out of it. So when very I was looking through these, I said, oh, shit, Sean, we got to read these more carefully before <laughs> we just publish this stuff. Um, and and uh, very interesting to me, the collision between um, cartooning and racial caricature and uh, I think that the, the tendency to reduce something to its most base form is uh, both a strength and a weakness about cartooning. And it's kind of hard to get away from that as linked to historical prejudices of in-group yeah. and out-group. And, and that and, is your job as a cartoonist is to essentialize. You have to distill right. things down to their most essential visual communicative language and that does get tied into those kinds of things but also within this there's these wonderful bits about like inking techniques and stuff that i find extremely instructive and valuable 
including Sean, I was telling you like oh. uh, about making rectangular shapes by holding a pin more flat. Look at that. And you can see that there. And this, these reproductions of some amazing pen and ink drawings and then showing them reduced and right. at, at scale. So that's the kind of stuff I know when we looked at division one, it was very basic, but as this series develops, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that I find not just historically valuable, but like actually valuable uh, as a pen and ink artist where right. those kind of training regimens that they went through have disappeared uh, in large. Right. So here's, I'll just flip through this, um, show what some of the lessons are. Human head construction. Look that was the name of my first band, by the way. <laughs> What kind of music was it? No. <laughs> that sounds like uh, some weird prog math metal. <laughs> it does. <laughs> oh, that's a fierce one there. <clears throat> I'm I'm actually not a fan of well, I am and I'm not a fan of seeing these structural relationships on a box like that. I think it's better uh to start seeing the head as soon as you turn these standard proportions that you get like this, which are very helpful, as soon as you turn it into the round it's better to realize that that's on a curved right. line on an arc. Yeah. But this is also yeah. helpful. Yeah. The, those, those in the box construction principles run through a lot of uh, art instruction from the time, whether it's burn Hogarth or, um, uh, Loomis, Andrew Loomis, there's some racial caricature. Yeah. Uh, here's some more here. problematic images we might need to edit out, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah <laughs> um the head and the neck in relation to the body this is fantastic this is something that i need to really uh, bone up on myself um but uh and here yeah, you see what is... i'm talking about when they curve mm -hmm. it i think that's more instructive um there there's something to be said for seeing it as a box too because a lot of students have a hard time seeing the curvature but right. if you plan it out as a box first and you see the perspective lines it's easier to get the curvature out of it surprisingly not much neck in any of those and just some Once really again, cool very reminiscent here of uh <laughs> mr edward moybridge <laughs> <laughs> who we learned in the last installment was quite the person yeah features and facial expressions notice this coming after the construction of course because um you know, students, which is this is aimed at students, have a tendency to dive right into the features and uh, want to make that the most, you know, prominent and immediate portion of their drawing, which is, of course, putting the cart before the horse, putting the nose before the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before nose the, before head, the face, the brow, <laughs> yeah. head brow. Right? And as we mentioned head last brow. time, this is this is from a period of time where they took a very structured approach to drawing, unlike a lot of the modern approaches, which are more responsive and intuitive. I personally like mixing and matching the two in my instruction. Right. Um, so I think it's good to get this stuff back out there too, so that it's holding its own against the, the right side of the brain, Betty Edwards stuff. Right. Um, really not that great emojis. <laughs> this is when you're so structural, that's what you're missing out on. Right. So perspective lessons. And to, freehand sketching, which yeah. is fantastic. That's And the, they have this, check this out. Like this little thing that you can take mm -hmm. with you, like a window. Um, some photographs. Like do I really like. You, sorry, go ahead. Do you ever use viewing apparatuses with your uh, students? Like, uh, you know, empty slides or anything like that? No, the most I ever do is like if they're having trouble, like creating a mental picture plane, I'll just like, right, gotcha. do that and be like, okay, use this like your camera, right? Exactly. But um, I used to I have don't, um, I don't do that. No, I used to have a thirty-five millimeter slide film that I popped out a bunch of the film, so it just had the frame. Oh, okay. And we would use that uh, when talking about composition and sort of as a baseline start. That's essentially what they're proposing here at the beginning. Well, and what I'll do too is I'll just let them take photographs. Like, 
right like we we, we all have phones now um but i'm i'm against those kind of things i'm against um like plumb line like actual having plumb lines and doing like sight size drawing where you're holding up the pencil and all right. of those more mechanical ways of transferring an image over one to one uh, that that's like i, I always say uh, i teach principles over procedures and those are procedures for getting things right right i'd rather teach the mental principles and and even if it their sure. drawings don't like if someone teaches uh how to use a plumb line and do sight size drawing their students are probably going to have better looking results right overall than my students right you know right. I'll, I'll have talented students who will get it right away but i'm willing to let them actually develop the mental abilities that are going on right rather than have a tool do it but sometimes okay. the tools help the sometimes the procedures help illuminate the principles and if i feel like that's going to be the case then i will do something procedural the big advantage of the of the empty uh, frame of the uh, 35 millimeter slide is that you can as opposed to a camera that has a fixed focal distance um, you can move it around and get an actual idea, you know, depending on how close it is to your face or how far away it is. I mean, it essentially gives you, you know, a, a method of <laughs> flattening the space that is actually flexible in the same way that your vision is. Yeah, um, that's a good point. I have a bunch of slides. I should pop them out. I was just looking at, uh, because my, my peer in the art department took a job somewhere else. So I'm the, I'm the whole art department right now. I was like cleaning up, like I can throw all this stuff away and there is a whole collection of slides. So I'm going to do that. The reason okay. I do this is because I, I never, I never had slides to do that with before. And I, I probably would have never thought about it, but I didn't want them to buy, buy, they, they have like yeah. these slidable viewfinders. I didn't want them to oh. buy anything else. And I wanted them to be able to like, you can also make it, this is basically what they sell you if you buy one of these sliding ones it's like this so you can make right. it a square and you can sure. change the aspect ratio um right. so i i'd rather just be like okay guys like or even right. do the old like this but my goal yeah. in the end is that they can use their mind's eye to frame something off right or work it out in a thumbnail no um, absolutely um yeah uh it sounds like we're pretty much on the same page as that that the construction stuff that they're showing here the the problem with that from a beginning drawing standpoint or um is there was a certain student or a certain beginner that as soon as you pull out a straight edge they're just their their observational abilities have gone away because they're you've allowed them to have something to fiddle with <laughs> well and and i found with perspective even though there's no numbers involved except maybe measuring out the paper uh it involves a ruler and they, especially the art kids, they go, oh shit, math. Right. And I'm like, you don't have to do any numbers though. Like, but <laughs> it's, it's amazing. You'll have only out of 30 kids, like two or three will adopt it with any level of ease and everyone else. It's just like a nightmare for them because I, I and I don't, I wonder if that's like a problem of our age you know, yeah. like the education now, it, the kids are so math scared. Um, they don't even know how to read a ruler, a lot of them. Like, no, that's just not a basic skill they've been taught. So rulers and numbers are just prohibitively terrifying to students right. in a way that I don't think was as bad back then. But I, I do have problems with these old perspective textbooks because they'll blah, 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 refer to figure 24 and you're like that fucking figure 24 but is like five pages later it's good that they started at least with the free handing i guess is my suggestion is that the uh teach teaching the basic principle but then encouraging freehand sketching using those principles essentially the the perspective checking vanishing points etc as a method of confirming what you're seeing is a superior method than constructing from something that's already in front of you well, I think I think Division One had the construction in it, though. Right. But they're getting the yeah they they're getting the basics down, um, and very good dis, um, demonstrations of it. That stack of the book right there is a great photo to demonstrate, um, you know, everyday objects in perspective and vanishing points and everyday objects. You could see the one on the top. We're looking up at it, 
and the one on the bottom, we're looking down at it. Yeah, above <laughs> and below the, the horizon line. That. Yeah, because students will mess this up all the time. They'll draw the top of that book. Right. Because they just know it's got a top, you know, yeah, things like that. So it is very good. I, I would have, as an instructor, also twisted the books so they're in two random different <laughs> two points. Like that's an assignment I give, but it's kind of mean. There's a there's a mild amount of two point perspective in that photo, but uh, it, it it's definitely a much further that second line. But they're all vanishing to the same right. point. No, like, there's I, a on the left hand side. There's a there's one that's just really 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 far away. So the amount of convergence is less. The the converging point is so far away that. You would be yeah, but they're all headed to the same points as, as my, oh, like I what see. I would have done is I would have gotcha. like, I would have taken it and like, you know, sure. randomly scattered Canted them. A few. Sorry yeah. for, there's all my sticky notes for when I read through books. <laughs> right. <laughs> Spilled them all over. So you're telling us about your cruelty right now. Well, yeah, because it's, it's a much cruelty. more difficult thing <laughs> to observe things that are stacked like a skew right where it's like each one is to a different two points uh, which by the way uh word of the wise uh if you have two points and going one direction and in the same picture you have two points that are not pointing at the same place if they're right angles to each other they still have the same distance between them uh <laughs> well, we little, could we could do a video thing. about this but you're you're talking about like if you tilt it it's still maintaining a 90 degree angle is that what you're uh, saying? I'm saying that the two vanishing points that come off of that object receding away from you, if you have another 90 degree object on top of it that's tilted in a different direction, those two vanishing points will be the same distance from each other as the neighboring vanishing points to the object below it. Just moved over. Yep. Like, you got okay, it. I'm a, well, yeah, I mean, that's a whole different video we could get into, but you're maintaining <laughs> 90 degrees. So if you say right now it's at, uh, what Sean's saying is, Right now, I have a 90 degree angle and it's running up to the horizon line up there and it's 45 degrees on this side and 45 degrees on this side. If I tilt this thing like 5%, I'm maintaining the, the 90 degree angles, but now it's uh, shifted it's 50 on this side and uh, sure. 40 on that side. Yeah, but yeah. the distance between the points just shifts over that yep. much. Yeah. That's probably a whole nother perspective video we should do. We just went way off the rails. Um, the Sorry. best, the I best drove book us into the perspective yeah. ditch. The best book for perspective by far that I ever read and that I give my students is David Chelsea's Perspective for Comic Artists yeah, because good. it avoids the pitfalls of like diagram eight way back here. Um, it's like this is what you're doing. Yeah, see, this says see figure twenty six and figure twenty six is here, and three lays okay. late, three pages later. Yeah, so David Chelsea's perspective for comic artists. I'm sure most of our viewers already know that. But look at these pen and ink drawings, man. Yeah. So even just, just as a collection to have those kind of things. So I, I like in the last people. one, very concerned with horses. I think every one of these, <laughs> every one of these has a horse section. But this is cool because it's giving the anatomy. Right. And you were saying last, look at that little horse butt. <laughs> <laughs> It's the got the sphincter. Legs. Yeah. The yeah. sphincter. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but every equestrian, every behind every great equestrian sculptor, there is a tremendous amount of knowledge of the anus. No, I never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they so focused <laughs> on that? well because you got to sculpt it <laughs> yeah i guess i would just put the tail over that bitch tails are more interesting anyways <laughs> now you got to put the tail up in the air it's for drama oh that's yeah the whole problem oh well that's why i'm not an equestrian sculpture look at this alex raymond face right here that looks like alex raymond kind of <laughs> um so application of the studies i think that's where they would send them in uh here's some old cartoon strips this is where i worry about if we're going to be able to reprint because it's this is probably no longer under copyright, but I don't know if the individual cartoons are under copyright still, because this is something from the Chicago Tribune. Yeah. We're, we're taking a chance putting this out in public and saying that this is something I'm actively looking into right now. Um, so uh, we got dibs, as I said in the other video, dibs. 
Yeah, we're putting okay. it. Th this will okay. be up on. By the way, th I've scanned this, and it will be on our Patreon for free. So we're not selling it. And if anyone wants to take it down, then let us know, and we'll take it down. But just trying to get it on the record. Um, this this is cool. It's originality in cartoon development. So just like how to generate ideas, spontaneous humor, start with pencil sketches, and it's just got a, lo a lot of different like exercises that you can go through. Uh, for coming up with things and again some really really beautiful pen and ink uh, rendering of faces and expressions for humorous illustration these guys i'm <laughs> uh -oh. assuming are like what not to do <laughs> i think we're going into dangerous territory here <laughs> now that there's humor involved <laughs> uh no i don't think no, so okay there's now. just that one chapter yeah i think um and the the pen handling um uh, you know the freed line you know, finally, at this point, we've had several decades worth of line that is free from the engraver, uh, the fiddling of the engraver, and uh, people really opened up in an unprecedented way. That's beautiful. Just and beautiful. this is why I grabbed these books in the first place. I thought there's got to be some instruction here on pen and ink that was at a time when that was more systematized and like right. a teachable thing. And that's what we're getting here. Um, is is something coming from a time where this was taught more than like, hey, we just look at it and screw around with it until until we get our own vibe. Um, and that poster, I was really interested to see how that he's turning his hand like really down to draw a rectangular shape with the pen. Um, I think that's something a lot of us would never even think to do these days. We all hold it like pretty much up right. and down and just use line weight changes. So. I think that's where the real value in these comes from and being able to see uh, original size and the size that it was reproduced right. at is something that I thought, you know, just for because we talk about that all the time, that would be really instructive for people. Um, just seeing how far things are spaced apart again, the original size and the reproduction like this looking almost like over like really detailed and kind of realistic and then you right. get it blown up and it's just <laughs> like what that's something i need to learn <laughs> i'll i'll still right. draw it that big and then i'll be like all right sean reproduce it size <laughs> again really cool the great like, samples here i mean just exquisite stuff <laughs> And here's, you see the sketch, right. uh, the sketch and then the finished piece. Um, and then lettering. I know some of our subs on the last one thought that even just for the lettering stuff alone, these books would be pretty cool because this is another, you know, in the day of computerized fonts. Uh, yeah. Just not as necessary. distinguish yourself. Anymore. Okay. Now here's the, here's where we get into the dangerous territory, but for, again, we'll, we'll show it just to show it's here. Uh, but I'm not going to read it. The, the The actual text in here is just like it was hard to even read some of it. Um, but what they're doing is they're showing the chalk talk, the crayon presentation, right. which was an old like you'd get on stage and you'd almost do like a comedy routine with your drawings, right? Like a vaudeville right. thing. And so they're literally showing you how to set up the supports for that and turn it over. <laughs> And then this is where the extremely racist thing comes in that was on the posters. They're giving you some specific stunts that you can pull, like starting with uh, something that would engage the audience is start with a letter and turn it into a face. And then right. they give a script, a suggested script word accompaniment, which is just an astonishingly. Yeah, totally execrable, you know, <laughs> yeah, racial and, bullshit. Yeah, an astonishing piece of stupidity. And it's presented as someone who's actually thinks they're being like an ally at the time, which I found to be a particularly bizarre historical interest is like this someone who thought that they're really progressive and they wrote this to it kind of gives you a, a, a sense of how things have changed. Um, and then here's some more expression studies from someone who's a little less structural than the first one. <laughs> And then I don't know why on the next page we get Abe Lincoln looking no expression. They're talking about 
drawing with the pencil. Correct. Um, so that's that's division. Oh, and then silhouettes, which is something I wish I'd think about more in my design. They focus a lot on does it look good in a silhouette? And I've never thought about that before, but it's so small. So this is cool. This is Frank King silhouette, you know, Fantastic. as one of the main instructors for here for for uh, some of the later articles in, in these books. So and this is division if two. If, you, if you're interested in silhouettes and you want to hear us uh, ramble on about them for uh, 30 minutes or so, watch the division one video. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where I drove the, drove the art car into the ditch there. Uh, talking about uh cut paper and all types of stuff but uh um yeah this is a quite the series and uh, we are talking about investigating the possibilities of a collection of these um but for now uh you can take a look at scans for free for the first two on our patreon account that's living the line yeah, and I'll, I'll put the link to this one in specific uh under the video for this because i don't know how to tag it to the category but this division two will be specifically tagged to the division two video if you want the specific link to the division one but they'll be free you won't have to you won't have to be a patron to get them um, i apologize are... for the low quality of the scan to uh they're high quality scans but patreon has a pretty low file size limit um so i've had to reduce them to to my eye kind of an unacceptable image level to get them to post um, if but if yeah you... those will be up and if you would like to uh, support us on Patreon, we really appreciate that. Uh, we do this uh, because you guys are interested, and uh, we do this because uh, you know we have a lot of different possibilities uh, that people suggest to us and things like that. And uh, uh, we can't do it without your help. So um, please do like, subscribe, check out our Patreon, hit the bell, and keep on watching, and and do some um, do some Rubik's cube. Uh, under the table oh uh, yeah <laughs> i'm fiddling that won't show up because i don't think that'll make it in my oh, camera right. <laughs> i don't know I, I just it was like it fell off the shelf when i grabbed the when i grabbed our copy of the strange death of alex Raymond, which i put back on the shelf but i didn't put you know i had solved this thing like i had gone through and like learned the algorithm step by step and solved this thing and when jack showed up last summer to visit he immediately <laughs> grabbed it and I was like, ah, oh, you little shit. Uh, and I'll never get back to it because it took me forever to do it with the cheat. Um, but the reason I have this, I want to figure out how to make a comic on a Rubik's Cube. Uh, that no matter which did. way you turn it will make sense. Well, that's a problem and a half. So sometime 5,000 years from now when i've had the chance to check every possible combination and make sure it works <laughs> we'll run a kickstarter for <laughs> the we'll do an nft of the virtual version uh, love, but that is I a challenge it. i would throw out there can someone yeah. figure out how to do it i've yeah. i've run the numbers on how many possible versions you'd have to have like how many how many combinations you'd have to check to ensure that it worked and i believe there's more possible combinations of a rubik's cube than there is known matter in the universe if well, i is it... <laughs> oh, if come I... on isn't it nine nine uh, nine to the ninth power i don't know man when i looked it up maybe it's one of the larger rubik's cubes I, it's some yeah, absurd now, amount though it's more than it's more than you could check it in a lifetime power would be um, oh yeah, so that's uh, is that that isn't this is three hundred and eighty-seven million com combinations. Um, is that it? Nine to the ninth power. Yeah, that's oh that's okay. Got there. Then it's Nine one of sides. the bigger Rubik's cubes. There's a big Rubik's cube out there that has more possible combinations. Well, I I, I don't think three hundred and fifty-four or fifty-seven million combinations is anything to sneeze at. <laughs> no, no, no. But there's ones that have like like 500 blocks on a side and like the possible permutations right. of that are like <laughs> uncountable. But yeah, th that was the problem I ran into. If, if you want to verify that your comic that could read no matter which way you turned it worked, you would have to verify, how many did you say? Uh, 357 million, uh, let me read the number, 387,420,489. I, yeah. I have an idea for you along those lines, but first we're going to hang up uh, so that I can tell it to you in private.
Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks for following along, everyone. Check back in for the Comic Con or Rubik's Cube Patreon that Sean has solved. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.